Okay, um, so what I'm going to talk about now is this paper, Bullies, Sissies and Crybabies, um, and really to focus on the broad theme of children and violence by looking at bullying, and specifically in this case, uh, a case study of school bullying, um, and to analyze it using two different theoretical frameworks. Um, the one agendered analysis to, to begin our discussions of the question of violence and masculinities and how those two um, things may be linked to each other. And the other is to now try and take a relatively unusual approach, which is to draw on ideas from not just psychology, but psychoanalytic theory, um, which um, deals with uh, one really important question for us now, which is, is what do people, how do people work with overwhelmingly neg negative experiences? What, what are the kind of internal processes that they use? And how does that link to our overall um, ways of thinking about violence? Now, one of the things we need to really pay attention to is um, the question of, of, of bullying. Um, and normally we understand it in quite a narrow sense, you know, like school bullying, workplace bullying, um, you know, there's a kind of individuals who, who are abusive, who uh, exploit others, who humiliate others, obviously. Um, uh, and often we're talking about people who deliberately try to make others feel bad um, in certain ways. And often they try and do it publicly. Um, now, I'm less interested in just the question of the, those examples of bullying than a broader question of bullying is why, and, and I think the issue that worries me the most, why do people often like bullies? This seems a really perplexing issue. Um, and for instance, it comes out politically. Um, in recent years, um, when you look around the world, uh, m many countries have democratically elected leaders who are primarily bullies. Um, certainly one sees this in, in, in places like the United States, but you see it in places like the Philippines, um, in, in Russia, in Hungary. Um, around the world, there's been a move to what, from a political standpoint, is called authoritarian leadership. People who um, sort of project this kind of tough guy um, uh, identity that they're going, like the strong man identity that they're going to crush uh, their enemies. They're going to start a, a war on drugs or a war on terror, or um, they're going to humiliate um, people from minorities. They're going to strip uh, human rights away from gender minorities. Um, they're going to be violent towards foreigners. This whole kind of political cluster of um, authoritarianism which is essentially what we would normally think of um, in individual terms as bullying. But what's interesting about these bullies is that people like them. They go to you know, the ballots and they actively elect them as their preferred political leaders. Um, and it seems that that's, that that process, the process of people actually liking uh, tough guys, uh, liking people who are who, whose, whose main quality is actually that they, they make a public show out of being uh, forceful, uh, dominating, abusive, violent towards vulnerable people. This is something we, we need to think about much more deeply. It's, it, it's, it's a very serious question. Um, and it comes out in small situations. Um, it comes out in a way in which, you know, often like someone who's a minor bully, they kind of have this sort of entourages of people who, who, who think they're cool in some kind of a way, um, you know, kind of a mean girls-ish kind of way. Um, and what is that about? I mean, that, that seems to be a really interesting question because, because it seems to be a really serious social problem. Um, so here's my founding question uh, in, 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 in this analysis. Why do some people defend certain kinds of bullying and abuse? Not, not, not in the first instance, why are some people bullies, but why do some people actually support and defend bullying? And the other thing is a really interesting question comes up. And it's a question that came up in the discussions around corporal punishment is this very, very common claim is that uh, it never hurt me. 
the, the reason that thing is okay, the reason bullying or corporal punishment or initiation is okay is because it never hurt me. In fact, it, and, and it, it is sometimes argued it did me good to go through that experience. How are we to understand the claim that violent abusive treatment uh, is experienced as harmless or even as positive? That seems to me really, a really interesting question. Okay, so this case study is based on a, on a particular incident at a particular school. The school is a, a kind of elite uh, private school in South Africa, very desirable place for upper middle class people to send their children to become part of the social elite. Um, and what happened is the press suddenly covered uh, uh, some incidents of very severe bullying. And when it's talking about severe bullying, we mean people actually being hospitalized with, with very serious injuries. And there was just the, uh, one or two smallish articles in the um, newspapers. And what I'm interested in analyzing is the public reactions. I'm interested in analyzing the online comments. Um, so less how the journalists represented it, less what actually happened, and more the way in which the public immediately became part of these comment threads that suddenly proliferated into a kind of flame war. Um, so, so we see this very, very active comments. And what I'm doing now is, is trying to analyze um, the online comments to sort out what the public sentiment around these incidents actually is. And the first thing that, that, that is very clear is that it's highly polarized. There's two extreme positions that are, that are at odds with each other um, in reaction to these uh, reports of bullying. Okay, now the first one is a position that really seems to actually be in favor of violence. It seems to endorse certain kinds of violence. And the first thing that the people occupying that position do is they deny that the violence is happening. And that's often a tactic. People who have a vested interest in maintaining a certain kind of violence generally start by saying that, it's, that the reports of that violence are not true. You know, the cops are not really shooting innocent people. Um, you know, uh, husbands are not really uh, beating their wives, uh, children are not really not really being abused by um, leaders of their faith. Um, so there's always this sort of phase of denial. So here, and I'm going to read you a lot of quotes because to me the, this analysis depends really deeply on the actual words of the, of the people participating in this flame war. Okay, so they're saying things like. Um, that these reports are complete and utter lies and nonsense, that bringing the media into it is downright vindictive and disgusting. And look at the strength of these words, it's vindictive, disgusting. It's not like we disagree. It's a, they're really a kind of visceral, hostile, embodied kind of feeling um, in here. And the parents who are complaining are the ones who were sissies themselves. And, now it went, and watch this language, this use of the word, sissies um, as, a, as one of the operating insults in this discourse. Um, th these comments then go on to broadly form an argument that the bullying, which takes place in the context of high school initiation in this example, it's part of like the younger uh, students entering the high school and being subject to uh, rituals of humiliation and physical abuse by the older students. And they argue that these, the bullying and, and initiation is, 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 isn't a problem. And this is like one step. Then now they're saying, well, it, maybe it did happen, but if it did, even if we acknowledge it happened, we're not acknowledging that there's any issue here. So you, you have phrases like a couple of smacks will not hinder future success. Initiations are there to build character and make you part of a team. Now watch that. Watch the words character and team unfolding here. It was done to us, so we will do it to them. You see, and, 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 and this, um, the two things, like it was done to us, and this is that argument of like, well, it never hurt me. But it's also because it was done to us, we will do it to them. And there's a, there's a kind of repetition, a cycle being built up here. Um, that, that same commentator after that says it builds character, okay? And this notion of character is really important to flag here. 
Uh, another another um, online commentator says it's better to be whacked on the backside with a hockey stick than to have have, have him hanging out in a drug infested nightclub. Okay, so here you've got really interesting. They're envisaging they the, these teenage boys with kind of life choice of either being you know beaten with a with with a hockey stick or ending up um, you know taking recreational. Um, mind-altering substances at a music venue, um, and and it, and it's very very clear that um, here the, the the physically being beaten is the strongly preferable option for for this person who one assumes is a is a parent of of one of these children, uh, given that what their comments. Um, what's really interesting when we get into it, though, is that a lot of this is about gender. A lot of it is about an, a, a very, very particular notion of masculinity that is being asserted and defended. And that when they start saying that, um, that, that they think the bullying and initiation is good, they arguing that it's good because it produces a, what they think is a, is a desired form of masculinity. And if you remember what I, the a quote that I read before, the word sissies, this is a uh, you, you, can, you can really understand people's perspective by understanding their insults often. It's like, what are they trying to defend uh, by what they're trying to attack? So the notion of sissies, this is a, this is a feminizing um, uh, insult. It's, it's the, the, the problem with a, a, a teenage um, boy being a sissy is, is precisely that they're being too feminine. Okay. So, Here's a, here's a specific quote where it's made very clear. Initiation produces men, not girls. Okay, couldn't be clearer than that. This is pre precisely the initiation is about gendering. Uh, and another quote, boys will be boys, so please get over it and let your kids grow up. Okay, uh, again, that, that this violence, this abuse is, is, is natural and intrinsic to masculinity. And we need to leave it. We need to let those, those abusive processes unfold because it's part of becoming a kind of um, a normal um, young man. Um, and it's very clear when, when looking at these concepts that, that, that a particular version of desirable masculinity is being constructed here. And we can see the elements of it, uh, that men should be autonomous, they should be aggressive, they should be able to defend themselves physically, um, and they should be able to attack others. They should, they should both be able to endure violence, but they should also exercise violence against others. Um, and this is contrasted to a particular version of femininity, which claims that women um, are weak and vulnerable and in need of support. Um, and this is precisely the, 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 you know, the force of, the, of this, this term sissy, this, um, this feminizing insult towards uh, adolescent boys that, that assumes that anything that doesn't fit with a, with a violent uh, construction of masculinity is, is highly undesirable. And a particular phrase that comes up in these quotes is the phrase running to mommy. And this seems to me very interesting. This is something that a, that a teenage boy should definitely not do. They should not uh, go running to mommy. And essentially what this is saying is that they shouldn't seek help from caregivers. Is they sh A, they shouldn't show vulnerability because that, that's what's wrong with running to mommy is it's a, it's, it's, it is evidence of their vulnerability. So they should not acknowledge vulnerability and they should not seek help um, from caregivers uh, when they are vulnerable. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, just on a, on a side note, this is exactly why one of the, that an even greater cause of death than homicide is male suicide. Uh, because because uh, men, men feeling like their gendered identity is so constructed around not being allowed to express vulnerability um, and seek help that they would literally, they literally end up killing themselves because they are unable to deal with um, feelings or to seek help in crisis situations. Um, but here it's important to see that this is being, this is, they, they, this is being policed very, very forcefully. Um, this, this distinction that men must be like this, and particularly teenage boys um, who are making the transition between childhood and, and early adult masculinity, that they need, to, they, need, they need to be beaten into this 
um, repressed violent masculinity uh, and they need to um, be, be forced to feel contempt towards their own vulnerable emotions. Um, so further quotes, um, I went through three different institute initiations. It built camaraderie and made me feel part of the system and it made a man, not a sniveling sissy out of me. Okay, so look at that. Uh, it built camaraderie, made me feel part of the system. So here's got this strong argument that, that what it does is, is this, this abuse produces social bonding and we need to look at that later on. But the contrast between a man and a sniveling sissy, like, a, and this is exactly like a, this is a, a sniveling sissy, someone who um, evidences uh, ordinary human vulnerability that is being seen as a quality that only women should have, um, and who expresses grief and distress. Um, and these are being made into things that are contemptible within this worldview. Um, and, the, and, and, and here the, the commentator goes on to say, I would, I would be more humiliated by my mom coming to my defense than taking a good lashing in front of everyone else. And that, that's really it. I mean, there you, you really hear the story that, 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 um, that the experience of actually being supported by a caregiver is, is, is made to be one that is humiliating. Um, whereas the experience of experiencing brutalization and not um, in any way um, trying to defend oneself against it or seek protection from it is seen as uh, a form of, of, of strength or seen as something admirable. Um, so what, we do, what, we, what is being constructed here is a very, very clear system that is very positive, both about people exercising violence, but also about them enduring violence. And what is being attacked is the idea that people should acknowledge their, um, their, their feelings of vulnerability and that they should seek help. Um, these, the, the, these commentators also then sort of start accumulating a further list of positive outcomes, allegedly positive outcomes, um, many of them centering around this notion of character. Um, and it building character that being beaten as a teen, as a young teenager builds character and it particularly builds masculine character okay when they say builds character they're really saying it builds it it builds this particular form of abusive masculinity that is so highly desirable within that community um, but they also say it, it taught them survival skills and it's interesting what kind of survival skills are being taught here because clearly it's actually destroying their survival skills if we if we know that the greatest sort of fatal threat to adult men is actually the threat of suicide clearly their survival skills the ability to experience their vulnerability and seek help is being destroyed here so they're not being taught survival skills they're being taught um, life endangering behavior patterns nevertheless what are these commentators think they mean when they say they're being taught survival skills. And, and the survival skills are precisely the skills of being opera, operating within a social network in which this, the, 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 this kind of abuse is normalized um, and to operate in that network without expressing the kind of human qualities that would be treated by contempt with the other, with the other, by the other abusive people within that system the people who feel contempt for all human qualities, which they associated uh, um, as being feminine uh, quality, you know, qualities of vulnerability, qualities of sensitivity, um, being able to both give and receive caregiving. Um, and of course, the other thing that they've argued already is that it produces a kind of positive social bonding. It produces loyalty to the social group. And that's interesting is why should it be understood as doing that? Okay, now that's one side of this argument that's happening online. There's another side of people taking the exact opposite position and they're making statements like this outdated and horrific practice should be banned. And it's interesting, the word outdated is really interesting. It's saying like historically, yes, people may have held those views. They may have endorsed that kind of violence or supported that kind of masculinity, but we don't anymore. We've learned something that previous generations didn't know. Um, and, and, and identifying the, the, the abuse as horrific of saying like this, um, that, that it, it should produce a negative reaction to anyone witnessing. Um, another um, 
an, a, another um, online responder says, how shameful to let physical violence be a norm in a school. And so once again, they're introducing the term shame there. Um, and the fact that the school, which should be a place of safety, a place of learning, a place of, of, of um, personal development, um, is being defined by violence. But here they get onto something most interesting. Most shocking of all are the parents defending this behavior. That adults condone this is very worrying. Another writer says, I'm disgusted at the thought that there are people who are okay with beatings, bullying, and barbarism. So here the pol polarity is very clear. So they're saying, well, the first thing they're shocked about is that the people supporting this violence against children are parents of, of exactly such children. Um, and there's something very weird about parents who want their children to be abused. And yet it turns out it's actually a very common desire. Um, and, and, the, and they're expressing what they're, they're, they're discussed at the normalization of this violence, okay? And, and, and interesting, like this, the words like shame and disgust are being used on both sides of this argument. Um, once again, they then start defending the whistleblower who'd actually leaked the information to the press. Um, and, they, and they say of, uh, um, of this mother um, that she was very courageous in exposing this violent behavior. Remember, the other side are attacking her and, uh, and, and saying that she's exactly the kind of sniveling sissy who they feel contempt for. Um, and, 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 and endorsing her good parenting, saying you did a good job, you protected your son as any parent should. So here you clearly have another position where they are totally against violence against children. They are in favor of, of people who act to protect vulnerable people against violence. And they acknowledge that part of good parenting is, is protecting your children from, from abuse, which is exactly the opposite. Interestingly, of course, it's often the mothers that are speaking on this side of the argument, and it's often the fathers that are speaking on the other side of the argument. Okay, um, so mothers are saying things like, no sane person can think it is all right for one person to bully another, or, or I can't see how physically harming another person creates unity and make them grow. Or this is not the kind of education that builds character, it builds thugs. So here you've got we're really homing in on this, this notion of character building, like that beating young men produces character. And they're saying, yeah, no, that, I mean, in as much as it builds character, it's building the character of thugs. It's building the character of people for whom violence is a normal and desirable tool to use in their social lives. But interestingly enough, one of the things I've, I've, that, that, I've, that I've spoken about so much is trying to look at the theory underneath these comments. Like when people make these little online comments like, oh, you're just being stupid. And, but we look at the wording and suddenly there's a theory of violence inside it, okay? And, and I've already said that there's a theory of masculinity and the development of masculinity going on here. But there's also a theory about the cycle of violence, about how violence is perpetuated across generations and through society. So look at the words that are being used by people on this side of the argument. The only people who seem to approve of this outrageous situation are the old boys. Um, in other words, the, 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 the men who went to the, that school themselves. This speaks volumes about the damage done to them. They are now inflicting this on the next generation. So, what, so, so there's quite an interesting theory being, being advanced here, is that the people who are defending their bullying and initiation are the ones who experienced it themselves. And the reason they're defending it is because of how it damaged them. Um, and that's really interesting, saying it's precisely because they are so brutalized that they've lost the ability to empathize, they've lost the ability to be sensitive, they've lost the ability to be vulnerable. And they're so obsessively identified with the violence of the system that all they can do now is reenact it against the next generation. Um, further, they start um, creating conceptual links between these, these uh, experiences of abuse and future harmful outcomes. Uh, and saying things like future people, future criminals who might beat up women or start a fight at a local pub, um, or another quote, in danger of becoming habitual bullies and sadists 
or police private security or bouncers where they can practice their pathetic insecurities. Okay, so here we're seeing uh, a, a, a implicit theory of cause and effect. They're saying that the people who, who experience this abuse and who normalize it to themselves will end up becoming criminals. Okay, they be end up becoming the kind of people who practice domestic violence, who, who in situations of stress in their intimate relationships will start using violence against their partners. People who in, in public spaces where they feel humiliated will, will, will get into bar fights and things like that. Um, and will even seek out professions where they can exercise violence and abuse on others. Um, and it's interesting, look at the phrasing of that, where they can practice their pathetic insecurities. Um, and that's interesting. That's a very, very pointed insult at the other group because they are claiming that precisely what is good about them, the pro-bullying lobby are saying what's good about them is that they, that they don't feel, in, they don't show insecurity, that they show, they have this facade of invulnerability. They don't cry. They don't seek help. They just, um, they just, get involved in repeating the cycle of violence. And, 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 and so this commentator from the other side is saying it's precisely because they are, are so insecure, because they can't manage their own vulnerabilities, and because they have to pretend to be strong and aggressive and repress um, those feelings within themselves, that they become abusive. And so, they're, so, so, so the danger of them becoming abusers and offenders is, is precisely because underneath this, this display of, 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 of this brutalized masculinity is an underlying um, insecurity. So when we look at this conceptually, um, we can see it as being about competing positions, okay, that, that each one has its own theoretical um, framework. Um, and they're not aware of their theoretical framework, but they have a theoretical framework. Um, but each one is also dependent on a version of masculinity. Each one has got an idea of like, what kind of masculinity is good? As a young, young boy develops into early adulthood, what is the best form of masculinity for him to take on as a personal identity? And how is that linked to a theory of violence? Um, but what's interesting here is that these two are so polarized. There's no kind of spectrum. There's like one that says this kind of masculinity is the best thing and we've got to fight for it. And the other is like, well, that kind of masculinity is a nightmare and it leads to violence and abuse and um, all these other factors. Um, so, so what's going on with this polarization? Within that, the interesting question is, why is it firstly men and secondly, mostly men who went through that experience of abuse themselves that end up defending it? Okay, and this is this we can formulate as a broader theoretical problem, which I really want you to think about. I want you to think about this. Um, why were the victims of bullying often the ones who defended it, which is a particular version of a broader question. Why do victims become perpetrators? I think that's the big underlying conceptual question that this is an example of. Now, there, there, there are particular theoretical approaches within psychology that, that can explain the damaging effects on um, learning, on self-esteem, on relationships, on pro-social and anti-social behavior um, of these kinds of experiences. Um, and I want to explore just one of them um, in trying to understand the situation. Now, the question of masculinity. It's clear that the people who are saying the bullying and initiation is good, they're not just saying that the specific acts are good, that this, you know, this particular, you know, assaulting this child, humiliating them in a particular way, that those things are good. They're saying that the kind of masculine identity that those acts establish is good. Okay, so, so the bullying and initiation are good because they produce a kind of masculinity. And what kind of masculinity? This is what's critical. Okay, a masculinity based on aggression rather than cooperation, based on dominance, not equality, based on 
uh, displays of strength rather than acknowledging vulnerability um, based on uh, this idea of, of autonomy in the form of dominance rather than kind of inter interdependence, um, mutual respect, caring for each other. And above all, based on the ability to not show any vulnerable emotions, um, so that any kind of, 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 of more sensitive uh, vulnerable emotions are regarded with contempt. And what is valued is the ability to be emotionless except for very certain emotions such as such as uh, violent angry emotions okay and and look at the words they use to talk about those masculinities they they, they frequently use the term real man uh, and this is to say that this particular historical version of, of masculinity is not a kind of arbitrary dysfunctional uh, consequence of, of particular cultural organization, but that it's the authentic masculinity. It's the right masculinity. It's a masculinity we should strive for. Okay. And what does it mean to be a real man? Then you look at the list of insults for people who are, who are being judged to not be real man, men. Okay. And what they're being accused of is being sissies, wimps, crybabies, ninnies, pussies, and most of all, they're accused of being a girl, okay? So it's very clear here that everything that needs to be beaten out of young boys' development to achieve this real masculinity is everything that is possibly associated with femininity. And that this particular kind of worldview regards masculinity as good and femininity as being contemptuous. Um, <clears throat> that much is very clear. But then we need to understand this other thing, is why then do some of the victims of this abuse uh, end up supporting it and being, becoming bullies and becoming those who support bullying, but others don't? And so there's, it, it, it's, and there's not a simple kind of cause and effect cycle that everyone experiences that becomes like that. Some of them go the other way and some of them are like, no, this is terrible. And this is where the split occurs. So why does it occur? Why does the split between those the, the victims who become perpetrators versus the victims who become people who defend the rights of other victims and try and change the destructive system. What's going on there? Because it'd be really worth knowing um, why some people go one way um, and others go the other way. Um, so one of the things we need to look at is the weird way in which a, people who are violent are idealized. And remember I talked about the election of these like, these, um, these authoritarian, tough guy, violent, abusive um, political leaders who, 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 who sort of run on campaigns attacking vulnerable people, attacking gender minorities, um, ethnic and racial minorities, national minorities. Um, always going after some weak person and attacking them and claiming to kind of build up national strength and pride by being abusive to a vulnerable group. Um, so um, the question, why do, why do some victims become bullies and others become kind of anti-bullies? Um, and here's some really interesting psychological stuff we know. Okay, it's normal for, for children. If you talk to children, they, they pretty much, at, up to a certain age, um, tend to idealize their parents, okay? They, they think their parents are amazing and know everything. They get very upset with people who criticize their parents. But the strange thing is, children who are in abusive caregiving situations actually tend to idealize their caregivers even more. They even react even more negatively to any criticism of their caregivers. They defend them even more then people are not in that situation. And that's really interesting. Like, why is it that, 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 um, um, that, that children who are, who are actually being cared for very badly idealize their caregivers and they idealize them more than children who are being cared for well? We need, to, we need to understand that psychological process. And it's not only in children. We see it everywhere. We see it in adult relationships that people get caught in abusive relationships and everyone is like, you need to get out of that relationship. It's very destructive for you. And, and, the, and people in, in the relationship of being abused are like, oh no, you don't understand. He's so amazing. And 
he's not really like that. He has these incredible qualities. He only gets jealous because he loves me. Um, and this kind of weird idealization, like it's almost like the abusive relationship is, is spoken about by the victim as if it's better than normal relationships. But we also see it in hostage situations. And you might, might certainly have sort of stumbled across often in the kind of tele, televisual accounts of hostage situations. Um, this notion of the Stockholm syndrome is thrown around. Um, the idea that when, 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 when people are actually trapped in an, in, in an abusive situation, like a hostage situation, instead of, in, instead of kind of being scared of their, 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 the people who are imprisoning, perhaps even torturing them, instead of hating those people, they actually start idealizing people and start identifying with them and take on their political values or their religious beliefs. Um, and that's also why cults work like that, that cults tend to work through uh, rituals of humiliation and abuse, including cults like armies. Um, and so they start by stripping away your clothing, making you all wear the same thing, controlling what time you can sleep, what you can do with every hour of the day, what you have to eat, um, um, make, uh, making people perform kind of feats of endurance, uh, physical exercise for hours. Um, so we see this, we see this in cults, we see it in armies, we see it in training for any organization that requires people to be violent and abusive. Um, but also in organizations that require people to kind of unquestionably idealize a particular leader. Um, and so, so, so the stripping away of identity and the rituals of, of physical and emotional duress um, are, actually, are actually known to produce that kind of idealization, which is strange because we would assume it produces opposite. We'd assume it would piss everyone off and they'd be like, well, I'm out of here. Um, this is terrible. I'm having a terrible time. I'm being, my, my body's sore. I'm being emotionally abused. Um, I, w I want to get out of here. And yet they don't. They so often do the exact opposite thing. They become, as through that process, they actually start becoming kind of obsessively absorbed into that set of values and that system. Um, and, and this is really what's being talked about in this notion of the Stockholm syndrome. Um, and one of the key things that happens that we need to look at in these accounts is, is, is something that, that, that this, this um, idealization is built on, which is the idea of a denial of harm. Okay, so look at these quotes. I was in an all boys hostel and enjoy reminiscing. Okay, reminiscing. This is some this person looking back with fond memories of like their childhood. Reminiscing about the days of being beaten and tortured. And this is crazy stuff. I enjoy reminiscing about the days of being beaten and tortured. I'm proud to say that I survived. I was taught discipline and respect towards your elders and would not hesitate for a second to have my children experience the same. Literally, I would not hesitate for a second to have my children experience being beaten and tortured. That is what this parent is saying, okay? We are supposed to be tough. What we're ending up with is a bunch of girls, okay? So there you have it. It's everything is in there, okay? So, so hey, kind of acknowledge we were beaten and tortured, but that they're proud of it. They're proud of having endured that. This parent wants the same for their children. They want their child to be abused in the way that they were abused. And see how often it works like that. See how often the argument is like, well, I had to suffer that, so I want other people to suffer it too. Not I had to suffer that, and it was terrible. So I want to make sure no one else has to feel like that ever again. It's the exact opposite of that. It's like I want other people to suffer because I suffered. It's kind of a hateful kind of, um, I'm, going to not, I'm not going to, and, and look at this, I'm not going to take my revenge on the person who hurt me. I'm going to make other vulnerable people suffer instead. And that's so interesting. Like, why do some people say, I, want, I actually want to make sure that that bully can't hurt other people. And other, some people say that, come out of the experience saying that. Other people come out of saying, I want everybody else to be bullied like I was, and that'll make me feel better about it. Um, Another big quote, it built camaraderie. It made me feel part of the system and it made me a man, not a, and made a man, not a sniveling sissy. See that man versus sniveling sissy, as in the previous one, um, ass versus girls. 
All the guys who were with me have since gone on to greater things. None of them are failures or dysfunctional guys. If anything, they're all great success stories. So this, this, this person saying, well, we, you know, we experienced this abuse and now we've gone on to be socially su successful. All of this, all of this is about doing one thing, is about not acknowledging that this was actually an incredibly painful, terrifying, humiliating experience. It's all about getting rid of any me negative memory and replacing it with this kind of idealized, like, oh, this, this made everything good. This is why I'm now like what I am in the world. Um, and here, I think we can draw on psychodynamic theory. Okay, so psychodynamic theory is really, it's a, it, it refers to the kind of psychoanalysis originally associated with the work of, of Freud, but now it's become a much more developed field than that. But within psychodynamic theory, there is a particular um, uh, theoretical idea of identification with the aggressor that I want to talk about. Okay. So now identification is a kind of a normal development process that when children are growing up, one of the ways they shape their identities is by, is by um, taking on characteristics from other people. So you often see as children are going up, they, they, they're very like their parents. They take on little mannerisms or views like beliefs or, or ways of talking ideas from, from their caregivers. Um, and, the, and those kind of become part of their personality. So this process of, of identifying with those around you, or they identify with a particular idealized figure, their you know, particular pop idol or sort of you know, movie actor or something, and, 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 and start taking on some of the little behaviors, patterns, ways of self-expression, beliefs of that, of that person. The identification is a kind of a normal way of a young person uh, child sort of assembling an identity for themselves from parts of the outside um, world. And uh, what we would hopefully see is they would identify with the positive things. They would see, they would identify with the people who are, who are, who are caring well for them, the people who are doing things that they aspire to, the, the, you know, the, the, perhaps, you know, this, this person is very loving or this person is a, a scientist or, or musician or something. They'd see those positive qualities and they'd want to take those qualities into themselves and say, I can, be, I can become something good like that. I, 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 I could do those things. Now, the problem is, what when negative qualities are internalized, okay? And this is what identification with the aggressor is about. It's about why kids actually often identify not with the positive qualities of the caregivers and those in the world around them, but with the negative qualities. Why does that happen? Now, firstly, this is not a conscious process. You know, the kids are not walking around saying, oh, I'm going to identify with that. I'm not going to identify with this. This is a, it's a kind of a reflex that just happens at a kind of a deep level. This is de it's, it's not a conscious decision. It's, um, it's, uh, it, 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 it's kind of an automatic emotional response to the environment. Um, and here's where psychoanalysis is useful because psychoanalysis is really, and one of its strong um, contributions is a theory about what do people do with overwhelming experiences when, it, when an experience is so negative that it will just kind of shatter you and destroy you. What do people do to carry on functioning in the face of that experience? And a lot of it talks about the mechanisms by which people kind of make experiences manageable or, or in, in, in different ways. So, so what's happening is that these negative experiences, these experiences of abuse, bullying, initiation, child abuse, uh, violence, feeling unsafe, all of those, those are, those are threatened to be overwhelming. Those are, those are terrifying, negative, unmanageable experiences that, 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 that threaten to be overwhelming. So something has to be done with them to stop them being overwhelming. Something has to be done to make them go away. Um, and essentially, it's done quite simply. It's done by forcing them out of the mind. And, and within psychoanalysis, the whole theory of repression, that you've, it's repressed from consciousness into unconsciousness. Okay, so, and it doesn't go away. Repression doesn't make it go away. It just forces it out of conscious awareness and keeps it in a kind of an, this unconscious uh, space. 
Um, and essentially, the argument in identification with the aggressor is that what happens is in that situation of, of, of fear, in that situation of abuse, the child or the vulnerable person, instead of they, 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 they push their own experience out of, out, of, out, of, out, of, out of awareness, but what they do is they, have, they then try to replace it with something. And what they do is they replace it with the perspective of the abuser, because in that situation, the abuser seems strong and they seem weak. So, 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 and this is, once again, it's an unconscious reflex. It's not a conscious decided thing. They, they push that, that terrible experience out and they internalize the perspective of the person who's in control, the person who seems to be fine, the person who seems to be making things happen, the person who doesn't seem to be vulnerable. And, and, they, and, and there's this kind of switch that happens where they're like, okay, th that's, who I, that's, who I, that's who I want to be. That's who it's safe to feel like in this situation. It's face, safe to feel like the perpetrator. It's not safe to feel like myself. Okay, and this switch from the position of the victim to the position of the perpetrator as a psychological defense against the terrible feelings. This is what identification with the aggressor is actually all about, okay? So we explain this as psychologically fleeing from the experience of the victim and taking refuge in the perspective of the perpetrator, okay? So in this way, the feeling of, 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 of being vulnerable, overwhelmed, abandoned, helpless, all of that has gotten rid of and it's replaced with the feeling of kind of being in, being in control, um, being safe because, because, the, because the aggressor is, is, is controlling those things. So by identifying with them, you, you can feel that sort of control. Um, and often, particularly in early child rearing situations, kind of um, that the, 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 the aggressor is not just the source of danger, but they're also a source of protection. And so, so the same parent who is abusive is also the parent who provides food or the parent who, um, you know, solves other kinds of problems. It's not simple in these situations. And, often, and we see this in the Stockholm Syndrome. The same person who's keeping the person a hostage is actually giving them food and shelter um, and in a way caring for them, even though they may be torturing them at the same time. They're paradoxically caring for them at the same time, keeping them alive. Um, and so that, so the positive function of the aggressor is, is, is held on to that. And, and, and if, if you, and if in a situation where if you just kept retaliating against the aggressor, if you just try to fight back or scream when you were being beaten, um, you may be placing yourself in more and more danger that the bullies may be more violent. And of course, this is exactly what the bullying political leader does is they say, um, I'll make you feel safe by bullying those people. I'll, it's okay to hate those minorities. It's okay. We'll, we'll attack these um, people on the basis of their ethnicity or their national origin or their gender. Um, it's okay. You can feel strong attacking those weak people and I will protect you uh, and I will build up our military and I will make the police more violent and, and I will throw out everyone who's different from you and I'll make you feel safe while we hate and persecute that vulnerable group. Um, so it's exactly the same process happening politically as is happening psychologically. Um, okay, so th as a theory, a psychodynamic theory of defenses, which are the mechanisms by which people avoid overwhelming experience, okay, the denial of harm is... Uh, 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 the denial that harm is being caused by the bully is precisely a, a psychodynamic defense against the oppor opposite realization. It's a defense. So saying like, oh, that was good for me is precisely a way of saying, of, of avoiding the realization. In fact, there was a moment in which I was terrified. I was overwhelmed with emotional pain. I felt vulnerable, weak, abandoned, all of those things. And, and by saying, oh, it was good for me, that entire experience is erased and cast out of conscious awareness. Um, so all that anxiety, all those negative emotions are gotten rid of, okay? 
And instead, the, the victim believes then that nothing bad has happened and that the perpetrator is good and that they should be like the perpetrator. And so what, happened is a tra- tra- what happens is a traumatic experience is replaced by an idealized memory. And it's not just an idealized memory, it's an idealization of a certain position within a violent relationship. So the, the position of the perpetrator becomes idealized. The position of the, of, 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 of the bully, the position of aggressive masculinity is idealized. And the position of vulnerability that is then pushed out of masculinity and said, oh, that's feminine, that's sissy stuff, that's girly stuff, that's running to mommy stuff. Um, it's in the same way that emotionally that vulnerability is pushed out of the mind, those human qualities are pushed out of masculinity and into femininity by these, by these boys who are being abused. And that this is supported socially, that it's supported by the networks around them. Um, um, so clearly we can see what's happening there. Interestingly, and here's what, what the, 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 the cause for kind of optimism, is not everyone's doing that. Okay, and this is why the two sides of the argument interest me. On the one hand, there's the kind of the, the fascist side of the argument, the side that says we might, we, all men must become invulnerable bullies and, and feel contempt towards vulnerability and femininity. And the other side of the argument is like, that is sick and destructive and pathological and harmful to society. Okay, so the people are saying no to the violence. The people are having maintaining sympathetic reactions. Why and how are they doing that? Because this is possibly where the space of social change exists. So why do some people not use these defenses and manage to keep the memory of their own vulnerability and their own suffering? Okay. Now, generally, it's, 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 it's assumed that to, to, to be able to do that, people have to have other resources. They have, to have, they have to have other kind of internal or external resources. External resources may be other people they could go to, um, friends they could speak to, caregivers who, who they could actually tell about the terrible thing that happened and expect to be comforted, but also that they've internalized the ability to, they've, they've had good experiences of, of, of being cared for and comforted in a way that they know how to care and comfort for them, themselves and know that in a terrible experience, um, they, they will they'll be able to come out of it in a and and look after themselves um, and 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 although it's horrifying in the moment that they'll be able to do something positive afterwards. Um, but for people who, who have grown up without that, who haven't, who who felt. Um, um, sorry about that, um, who, who, who've always felt vulnerable, um, who have often felt vulnerable, who, who haven't felt well protected, they're at very high risk of not being able to do that, okay? So those are, a, are able to retain the awareness of the painfulness experience without having to go into denial, without having to displace it. Um, so, so, so being able to stay with that, that experience and expect to be able to survive it, care for themselves, seek care from other people, still be accepted, not be humiliated in other environments, not be abandoned in other environments. Those are, um, those people won't have this idea to perpetuate that violence against others, okay? Um, they'll be able to, to, to keep within themselves the experience of grief, the experience of regret, um, and rather than getting sucked into it, it was done to me, so I'm gonna do it to them, they're able to grieve over it. They're able to see the harm in it. And they're able to empathize with that in other people. And this is the critical thing we're gonna talk about later, is that they will, they'll retain the ability to empathize with that vulnerability because they, because they will know what it felt like in themselves. People who have had to, to get rid of that experience in themselves can't empathize it, but with it in other people. In fact, they have to get rid of it in other people too by expressing contempt towards them. Okay, so here what we start seeing is that the, that the availability of other positive social experiences which are internalized, the ability to, to, to hold on to the experience within oneself, and thus the ability to empathize with it in others is precisely what then creates the capacity 
to want to pre prevent other people being harmed, to care about other people, to care about um, not perpetuating systems of abuse and violence, even though they may be socially normalized, even though the dominant values in the society may encourage that form of contempt or hatred or abuse, that people manage to hold on to a sense in themselves that that is not right and that something should be done about it and that it's possible for people to treat each other differently and to create a better social system in which people don't have to be harmed and don't have to become destructive. 